The men who play America's National Football League are among the highest paid athletes in the world. However, their fame, money, and hard partying ways often put them at odds with the police. From drinking and driving to domestic violence to accidents that lead to loss of life and limb, these are five of the wildest body cam encounters between NFL players and the cops, starting from wide receiver Antonio Brown. On November 28, 2022, Tampa police arrived at the home of former NFL star Antonio Brown. Having just retired from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers the year before, Brown was a well-known and high-profile star in the area. The video starts with the police officer demanding that Brown exit his mansion to talk to them. Come talk to me over here. Okay. Right here? As the cops attempt to negotiate with Brown, the star wide receiver continually refuses to unlock the door. I got you. I'll talk to you. They can't go far, though. Antonio, listen. Okay. The police are there over a call from a woman who alleges that Brown threw a shoe at her, but it doesn't appear that the woman is currently in the home. At this point, the police are only attempting to have a conversation with him, but the fact that he won't open the door makes that extremely difficult. Okay, the, well, talk to me. What, what's going on? I can't really hear you, though. You want to crack it a little bit? You want to go to the window? After the police officer insists that Brown isn't in trouble, Brown agrees to speak to them through an open patio door. You're, hey, Antonio, you're not in trouble. Okay, okay, well... Okay. At this point, it becomes clear that Mr. Brown is not the only person in the home, which could have potential to complicate matters in any other situation. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. Crack ass so I can hear you. You know what I mean? Fortunately, the police continue to tell Brown that they only want to gather information and that he's not in trouble. They're, they're over there. It's only me. I'm, I'm right here. You're not, you're not in trouble, man. The officer also asks if Brown remembers him from a previous encounter, which apparently he does. You remember me, right? I wrote... Yes. Yes. Okay, I wrote, the re I wrote the report for you, remember that, right? The whole time I was cool with you, right? Okay, so let's just talk. Let's, let's, you want to talk to me on the phone? I'm on my phone. Do you, have a, do you have a screen on the front door? I mean, just so I can talk to you, so I can hear you. Just so you want to go front door? Yeah, yeah. After moving to the front door, Brown seems to indicate that he's scared that if he opens the door, he'll be arrested. It's only me. I, I can't hear you. You too, brother. You want you want to just crack it a little? It's just it's only me. I mean, the officer asks if he can have the woman's ID and purse, but Brown claims he doesn't have them. So let's do this. Can we at least give her back her ID and stuff real quick? Can we do that? Oh, you don't have it? Oh, there's nothing in there. So there's no purse or nothing. None up, nothing up. Okay. The bro goes into a lengthy explanation of everything that happened between him and the woman. The cops still can't make out what he's saying. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I remember I, I saw the call and I was like, hey, maybe he'll talk to me because we had a good interaction. You know what I mean? Right. So no matter what happens, you're going to just deal with me. That's it. It's very easy. It's, al it's, always, it's always been like that. So, so let me ask you this. Are you willing to talk to me be besides this? No, no, I, I understand. I know you're not doing it to, to me. I just can't hear you. And since the woman who called the police seems adamant that her stuff is in the house, the officers have no question but to keep pressing Antonio. So let me do this. Let me see if, because she talked about an ID and a purse. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Let me just see what else she's talking about, and I'll, I'll ask you if it's in there. Is that cool? Finally, the officers tell Brown that if he doesn't let the woman in to get her things, she can have someone open the lock and let her in. But let me just tell you this. I don't want this to happen, okay? So I'm, I'm talking to you. Hear me out first. Listen, listen to me. Between me and you, if you don't let her in to get her things, I'm telling you, because it's out of my hands, but I'm just warning you because I'm telling you man to man, okay? If you don't let her in, I'm telling you, if she wanted to have that dude do the lock thing, she can. He explains that this is because the woman is still technically listed as a resident and there was still time left on the eviction. She's technically still a resident here until the eviction process is, because there's still seven days left on the eviction. Listen. You're not in trouble. You're not gonna. I, I know. I know. But I want you to hear it from me. You're not in trouble. You're not gonna get. You're not gonna get arrested. Okay. So listen. He explains that he has five minutes to let the woman in, but that the officer will walk with her to ensure she doesn't take anything. Oh, and and I would I would be with you. I'll walk. I'll hang out with you while she gets it. I'll I'll I'll, oh, I'll go with her. No, no. Listen. You want me to go with her? I can go with her. So if you want, I will walk with her so she don't take nothing, and then we'll get it and she'll leave. And that's it. Yeah, let's do that. Though the situation is still very tense, Brown agrees to open the door and let the woman in with the cop. Hey, hey. Yeah, we can do it. Yep. M make me make me look good. Make me look good. That's it. But let me go with her, though. Yep, yep. You want me to get her? Okay. 
Hey, um, what's your name? Though Brown is smoking marijuana, the officer assures him that he's not in any trouble. You and me are good. Yeah. I don't care about the weed. I don't care about none of that stuff. Huh? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. When she comes here, I'm going to go with her. Sure. But listen, you got to leave the door open. You can do you, you know what I mean? Okay. Okay. Brown expresses a little hesitancy about the other officer being so close, but they assure him no one else is coming. Listen to me. She's going to leave. I got it. Trust me. I got it. Let's get her stuff, and that's it. No, no, he, he's got to be, he's got to be close. He's got, he has to be. He has to be close. He's not going to come in. He's going to be just right up in here. I'm not going to come in your house. It's only me, Antonio. Just so we could be done with this, ma'am. However, Brown becomes extremely paranoid due to the other cop and decides not to let them in after all. Later on, the woman would drop the charges for the shoe throwing entirely. Weird situation, isn't it? Substance abuse is a rather common occurrence among NFL players, some of whom have earned big reputations for their hard partying ways. A rather bizarre example of this was the August 9, 2022 arrest of former Seattle Seahawks running back Marshawn Lynch for a suspected DUI. The incident occurred in Las Vegas, not far from the infamous Strip. Lynch was found asleep in a car that had noticeable damage, including a missing front wheel and rim and loose tire on the passenger side. Control 2 Baker 13, the passenger side wheel is on uh, a flat as well. The police officer first approaches the car, a Shelby GT500, from the rear. She notes that the driver must have driven for some distance on the rim, given the indentations on the concrete. Control 2 Baker 13, from the indents in the uh, concrete, it looks like he drove quite some ways on the uh, rim. Do we have any, uh, I don't know, any calls with a vehicle matching this description? She then asks her dispatch if there's been any calls regarding a vehicle with this description before moving around to the driver's side to find the door open, with Lynch asleep on the inside. Copy. I'm not worried about the car taking off. It's totaled. He destroyed the engine. It's laying on the ground. Control 2 Baker 13. It's going to be a Ford Mustang, and the gentleman that's in the driver's seat is wearing an orange sweatshirt and blue jeans and white, orange, and black Nike shoes. At this point, Lynch begins to move around to the driver's seat. Still, the officer waits for backup before actually interacting with him. I've never seen somebody drive a car to the point where the rim is totally gone. One of the new officers asks if she's run the VIN, which she had not. He's still sleeping? Yeah, he was spitting. Okay, hold on. Did you run it, the VIN? They inspect the car in order to make sure that there's nothing inside that might be a threat to them, then decide to wake up Mr. Lynch. Morning. How are you? Huh? You don't know. Why not? You know where you're at? When asked whether or not the car belongs to him, he appears completely confused and tells the officers that he stole it and doesn't know who he is. Did you steal the car? Yes. <laughs> we said you don't know whose car it is. Just asking. <laughs> it's better like that? Well, I guess if you're going to destroy a car, it shouldn't be your own, I guess. The officers ask Lynch if he has an ID or any weapons, and he denies having either. You got an ID card? You got any weapons? No? He seems to be in a pretty good mood, telling the officers he was both coming to and heading home. The officers seem genuinely amused by his strange answers, but it's unclear at this point if they knew who the driver is. You know where you're coming from? Where were you coming from? Home. Where's home? You know the address? You don't know? Alright. Where were you headed to? You were headed home? Yeah? Where'd you stop in between? Right here. Man. You're just full of awesome answers today. Marshawn Lynch has been a major NFL player from 2007 to 2019, so it's possible that they were well aware of who he was and simply didn't want to tell him. The officer asks if he'll exit the vehicle, but he declines. Are you able to get out of the car? If you want to. Okay. So you're going to get out for me? No. Kind of what I thought. The cops again ask Lynch if he knows his name, but he tells them it's Terrell, which happens to be Marshawn's middle name. What's your name, bud? What is it? Terrell? What's your last name? Say it again? Nietzsche? <laughs> I'm I can't hear you, dude. Can you spell it for me? O-I-N-C-H? 
Oh, L-Y-N-C-H. Gotcha. After roughly 20 minutes on the scene, the police are getting nowhere. They have a half-conscious man, an unregistered car, and very few answers. They ask Lynch if he's ever been arrested, and he says no. Have you been cited or arrested before? No. Hmm. They ask if he has a driver's license, and he says yes, but doesn't produce it. Do you have a driver's license? What state's it from? Nevada? They then ask if he's hit anyone or anything with the car, and he shakes his head no. What'd you hit with the car? Did you hit somebody with the car? No? Did you hit anything with the car? No? It's at this point that they ask about drugs and alcohol, but Lynch claims that he doesn't do either. There are at least six police officers on the scene, so it's clear they're losing their patience. How much did you have to drink? You don't drink? Do drugs? No? He said he doesn't drink and he doesn't do drugs. Have you ever seen anybody drive a car like that? The team of cops ask Lynch one last time if he'll get out of the car if they need to help him out. They assure him he can't drive away because the car is completely inoperable. Alright sir, are you going to get out of the car for us or are we going to have to help you out? Right now, if you don't get out of the vehicle, you're going to be charged with obstructing an investigation. That is a criminal offense and you will go to jail. What kind of Obstructing. Eventually, they're forced to pull him out by force and handcuff him. Why will I not be pulled out? Mm. Brody, get on your stomach. Roll over. As the cops get a strong smell of alcohol, they're forced to arrest him for suspicion of DUI. He does smell like alcohol. Oh, I do smell like Yep. So right now, you're yeah, being arrested for the suspicion oh, of DUI. Okay. Lynch would ultimately receive four charges, including driving under the influence, driving an unregistered vehicle, failure to stay in his lane, and failure to surrender. There seems to be a bit of a running theme with NFL players not wanting to exit vehicles when told to by police. For instance, just a few months after the Marshawn Lynch arrest, Baltimore Ravens wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. was escorted off an American Airlines flight for allegedly refusing to put on a seatbelt. The incident took place on November 27, 2022, aboard a flight from Miami to Los Angeles. The incident begins with police entering the airplane jet bridge so that they can get on the plane. They speak to security officers and flight attendants who tell them that they have an intoxicated male who's repeatedly falling in and out of consciousness and refuses to put on a seatbelt or listen to intoxicated male up behind. At one point, they're asking me to leave the plane because they don't want to fly five hours to LA within his conditions. Not responding, put on your seatbelt, and then broke him off. And, uh, and, uh, so, and, uh, kick him off. The cops decide that they'll need to deboard the plane in order to ensure everyone's safety and enter the first class area to speak with airline officials. Footage from airport police body cam shows the initial interaction between Beckham and the flight crew. A flight attendant tells the responding officer that Beckham seems drunk and unresponsive. So I understand that that one passenger, is very, he needs to get off, right? Yeah. They're really intoxicated, belligerent. No, he just, that he was unresponsive prior to push. He seemed okay, then after when they pushed, they tried to get him to put his seatbelt on, but he was still passed out. They find Beckham more or less passed out in his business class cubicle, at which point they wake him up and begin asking questions. How you doing, man? Can I speak to you for a second? Yeah, yeah listen. How you doing, bro? Rene Garcia, Sergeant with Miami-Dade Police Department. Nice to meet you. One of the flight attendants mentions that he hadn't been wearing pants, but it's clear that he is now. There seems to be a lot of confusion about Mr. Beckham's condition, but because the crew had the final say over who flies, they're forced to call the Miami police. Representatives inform responding police that nobody feels comfortable with Beckham flying. However, upon being told to leave by crew members and airport police, he became belligerent and refused. Crew at this time don't feel comfortable with him flying because they're not sure what's going on with him. So I just kindly ask him to just go ahead and be plane and I'll put him on the next flight, which actually leaves an hour and a half from now. Okay. But now he's being belligerent and non-compliant to the one that come so. The cops again say they'll need to deplane everyone before speaking directly to Beckham, who's lying down and seems intoxicated but otherwise perfectly fine. Unfortunately, we have to deplane everybody to get them on. Correct. 
the okay, government unit. refuses to come Alright, so that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to deep plane everybody. Once we have everybody deep plane, then we'll deal with him. Uh, and hopefully he'll, he'll get off yeah. peacefully. If not, then... Yeah. Let's go, let's go. Okay. He speaks to the cops in a very low voice, but they insist that the crew has the final say on whether or not someone stays on the flight. Beckham clarifies that this has never happened to him and is trying to avoid any undue embarrassment. Hey, just li listen, listen what's going to happen, brother. I, just, I don't I want to avoid any embarrassments or any issues. The crew, the, the captain's the one that makes the final decision. Right now, for whatever reason, they're asking you to leave. They're going to rebook you on the next flight. I don't want it. Okay, okay well, this is what's going to happen. As soon as they get off, you can do whatever you got to do. We're going to have to, we're going to have to deplane everybody on this plane and then you're still going to get off. As everyone else on the plane begins to deboard, Beckham begins to get confrontational with some of the other passengers. At one point, Beckham tells the man that he would never in his life get off the plane for him, insulting him several times. I would never, ever in my life get off the plane for you, specifically you, maybe everybody else. I would get off the plane. This shit don't mean nothing to me. Ain't no way you could look at me. Yeah. Never. Ever. Guys, just, just, just don't Ever. engage with them. Just, just don't no. engage with them. Quick, quick, you gonna wait 40 to minutes, out, and I'm gonna be on a private yeah. plane home. Good. Yeah. Get your fat ass. Enjoy yourself. Yeah, I will. Get your ass off the plane for a second. Yeah, I bet. Enjoy the cheese board on the way home. Get your ugly ass. After an extensive deboarding process, police help Mr. Beckham off the plane, allowing him to get his luggage and then escorting him through the terminal. Hey, we got everybody off. Okay. Don't forget your stuff up here. This happened without incident or arrest, though some of the other passengers did clap at his removal. The officers make it clear that they know who Beckham is, which has led many people to accuse the officers of special treatment. Even with the body cam footage, it's unclear whether or not Odell Beckham had done anything really wrong. However, what eventually did him in was the fact that he remained so unapologetic about the whole thing. He could have been spared a lot of undue embarrassment if he merely left the plane when asked. To that point, Beckham could learn something from Arizona Cardinals linebacker Zavin Collins. Collins was pulled over in Scottsdale, Arizona just after 10 a.m. on June 20th, 2021. Body cam footage showed the officers approaching Collins' car and asking him what he's up to. Collins tells them that he's on his way to pick up his friend and is unaware that he was speeding. The officer responds and tells him that he was going 76 in a 35 zone. How's it going, officer? You tell me how it's going, man. Yeah, Jeez, just, what are you doing? I'm going to pick up my friend. You have any idea how fast you were going? No, sir. 76. No, I was not going You were 76 miles an hour. Do you know what the speed limit is? No, sir. 35. Oh, I apologize. I, I you are have 41 no miles an hour over. No In this record. case, Collins is extremely polite the entire time. He apologizes for exceeding the speed limit and tells the officer that he plays for the Cardinals. I play a uh, ball here in Arizona. Is it card? Uh, negative. It's going to be a red uh, Mercedes. Is it Cardinals? The unimpressed cop asks Collins for his license and registration. As he retrieves his mobile insurance card, Collins remains extremely polite and apologetic. All right, do you have the registration oh, insurance? Yeah. This is right here in my, this is just... Okay, any weapons? No, okay. no sir, no sir. You're good. I have the mobile insurance, sorry. No, you're good. That's perfectly legal. You might have to take a look at okay. that. Do you mind if I touch your phone? No, yeah, you can go ahead. I'm, I'm laid back here. Cool. However, after several minutes, the officer asks Collins to step out of the car. All right, partner, go ahead and step out of the car for me. Oh. He complies and is promptly arrested for excessive speeding and reckless driving. You just put your phone in your wallet down. Put your inside. All right. Stand right there. Put your hands behind your back. You're being placed under arrest for excessive speed and reckless driving. What? Collins expresses some surprise at this charge, but is informed that it's standard given the amount by which he was speeding. Once you exceed 20 miles an hour in the state of Arizona, it is a criminal offense. It but is you, a misdemeanor. I mean, okay. Okay. Um, you are, yes, sir. You are yes, 41 sir. miles an hour. It seems the officer had intended to arrest Collins the entire time, but had been waiting for backup, likely due to the young man's athletic 6'4", 260-pound frame. Though Collins complies throughout the traffic stop, he continues to express dismay that he's being arrested at all. Like I said, at this point, you put us in a difficult spot, anything over the 20, but like I said, I mean, it's a guys, quick... Look, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be completely guys, honest, I mean, man. You guys, like, I've, I've been cool, no, been you, chill. I, like, I'm, I'm not saying you haven't. Can you please, and like, I'm, please But sir. at this point, when we're this much over the speed limit, but like, sir, there's, there's really no excuse, and you're just on your way to pick up your friend? Come on. The police inform him that the misdemeanor offense is simply due to Arizona law, which mandates arrest for anyone doing more than 20 over the speed limit. 
He does ask if they can help let him off with a warning, but otherwise remains fully cooperative and polite the entire time. Okay, so you guys... I'll grab your phone real quick. So, we'll grab your you phone. You guys can't help at all. I'll go check the VIR. Sir, the the, the most we can help is get through this as clean and easy and quickly as possible. In fact, the arrest barely even registered on the sports controversy radar, and Collins was released less than an hour after the incident. Where Zavin Collins' arrest is an example of everything going right, the incident involving former Raiders wide receiver Henry Ruggs is the exact opposite. On November 2nd, 2021, an intoxicated Ruggs rear-ended a car in Spring Valley, Las Vegas. Due to the speed at which Ruggs was traveling, the impact caused the car he'd hit to catch fire, resulting in the death of 23-year-old Tina Tinter and her dog, Max. Police eventually produced evidence that showed Ruggs was driving his Corvette at more than 156 miles per hour and likely struck Tinter's car at around 120 miles per hour. Arriving. We got a block the intersection. Body cam footage shows police arriving at the scene to find Ruggs' Corvette near a light pole and Tinter's car on fire in the middle of the street. The officers approach the car but can't get close enough because it's completely engulfed in flames. Control 449. The vehicle is completely on fire. We cannot tell it. They begin asking bystanders who was in the Corvette. Hey, who was in this vehicle? One man who appears to live in the neighborhood whispers to one of the officers that one of the people on the ground is Henry Ruggs and that he plays for the Raiders. I, I know somebody about your neighbor. This is Henry Ruggs right here. This is Henry Ruggs right here, bro. He's playing for the Raiders. Relax, calm down. Calm down. Take your tweet, bro. Take your tweet, bro. Take your the responding cops call for medical assistance and begin to close off the street. Hey, we got medical coming up, okay? He needs medical, right? Hold on. At this point, firefighters arrive and begin putting out the flaming vehicle, unaware whether or not there's a person inside. Once the fire is out, the firefighters begin working to inspect the car and see if there is anyone inside that might need rescuing. Hey, somebody inside that vehicle do you know of? The car? Unfortunately, at this point, both Tina and her dog are deceased. They continue to block off the area in order to protect the scene. With the scene secured and the fire out, the police officers begin attempting to piece together what happened. Well, maybe when they got hit, yeah. you lose control. You know, you get knocked out and then the car keeps driving. They see just how long the skid marks are and compare them to eyewitness information that says the Corvette was going extremely fast and hit the other car, pushing it some distance. The bystander apparently attempted to help the person in the car, but reported that it almost immediately began to catch fire. So he was telling me that uh, he saw the Corvette like speeding, and then you see he hears a loud bang, and then he comes over here, and he's like, apparently, I think he said two people in the car, he tried getting them out, but all of a sudden, the wind started going crazy. Yeah. At no point during the incident did police talk to Ruggs or his passenger, who received medical care for non-life-threatening injuries. Later that day, Ruggs was arrested and booked on a charge of DUI, resulting in the death of another person. He was released by the Raiders that same day, less than 24 hours after the incident. In May of 23, Ruggs took a plea deal and pled guilty to causing the accident in exchange for a sentence of 3 to 10 years. 